Asia is an enormous growth opportunity for IoT and for Australia because of that relationship. So to share some insights on that opportunity, please welcome Lee Hicken, who's the IoT Business Development Lead for Amazon Web Services, APAC. Good luck. Thank you. Good. Yes, you can hear me. Um, wow. So um, thank you, Dylan, has taken us glaringly into the future and painted a wonderful vision of it all. I'm going to bring us a little bit crashing down to reality. Uh, unfortunately, I live in the practical world of actually trying to deploy, develop, and sell IoT solutions. So I'm the, where's my tapper? There I am. I run Amazon's business development unit for IoT based out of Singapore. Uh, for the last three years, though, I've had the privilege of being in the IoT ecosystem, uh, both here in Australia and, in, and now in Singapore. And that's given me the opportunity to, to explore and, and uh, experience a whole range of levels of maturity in the IoT world. Uh, so the last year I've been in Singapore, I've had the opportunity to work in Korea, in India, in the ASEAN countries, so Vietnam, Singapore, Malaysia, uh, and of course Australia and New Zealand. And I have never seen a more diverse set of uh, levels of maturity, levels of skill, and levels of excitement and development around IoT from you know, the world of Korea, where industrial, heavy industrial automation and, and consumer goods and, 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 and numerous businesses have been doing IoT now for 15, 20 years, and they would be on what we would call IoT V2 now. They've actually already built the base systems. They've already done what we are now thinking about building in our startups and our, and our industries here in Australia. They're actually now challenged with a new problem, which is how do, I, how do I build something on top of that now is embedded in the business I have? How do I build V2 of this? How do I take what I already have, actually, and enable it with the newer technologies, with cloud capabilities, with scale, with all the new uh, technology and services and sensors and things that are available to me. The Indian market is fantastic. The amount of government investment in the startup community there is beyond comprehension to what I've seen anywhere else. Huge amounts of startups, massively mobile and connected community of people that really understand the technical challenges. Um, and it's just an untapped resource for, for a lot of uh, Australian and, and Asia-wide customers and companies who should be tapping into that. And then, of course, in, in the ASEAN countries, particularly in Malaysia and Singapore, a uh, huge amount of govern, government investment, massive amount of government strategy initiatives that are already now, these are not papers being built, these are design papers that are written, that are done, and they're driving a huge amount of commercial investment. And the great strategy there is not, here is the government strategy and here is the government infrastructure, it's here is the government strategy, go commercialize it. Go build solutions, go build technology wrapped around that. Now, obviously, that's very heavily focused on smart cities and, and sort of governmental services, and that's probably due to the sort of the, the nature of the ASEAN countries, highly, highly developed but highly concentrated in terms of populations. So there's a huge amount of opportunity, and we're even seeing partners in the region. So we have partners like FPT, based out of Vietnam, a huge organization who are now building solutions across the region. They've partnered up with a, an organization here in Australia, down in Adelaide, called Comnet, uh, and built out a solution for Sealy, uh, for around IoT-connected air conditioning units. Pentair in India doing similar kind of things. It's huge amounts of opportunity for us to really tap in to that set of resources, that technology that lives around APAC. But I did say I was going to bring us down crashing to reality, and I will get to that in a second. Um, I've been with Amazon now for a year, uh, and I've dealt with everything from Amazon, the book company, Amazon, that river in another country, to Amazon, the destroyer of all things. I'm used to it. What I wanted to just quickly share with you today is a little bit about what Amazon means from an IoT perspective, uh, and what we have and, and where, where we're structured. But I'm not going to spend too much time talking about us. So Amazon Web Services IoT, we launched our IoT service back in December 2015. So it's you know, coming off for nearly two years old now. That IoT service, the specific service, and, and I'll talk a bit more about the details of this towards the end, but that service, that piece that manages the brokering of data from things into the applications in the cloud, is now available in our Sydney, in our Singapore, our Korean, our Chinese, and our Tokyo-based data centers and infrastructure. We also have AWS Greengrass, AWS at the Edge. I'm going to talk a bit more about that in particular towards the end of this. That we launched pretty much a year from now, November 2016. And that Greengrass service is available in Sydney and Tokyo today. But here's the real thing. IoT is not about this model of thing, data, the drop it. It's really about the end-to-end -end service. It's about what are you going to do with that? And that's why we hear so much about 
you know, AR, VR, AI, machine learning, and data analytics, and all the things that you actually need, the practical things. I need to visualize the data, I need to, to display the data, I need to present the data in a mobile device, in a service, in some kind of way that somebody's gonna be able to use. So whilst we talk about our IoT service and what it does, really, the IoT service is everything you may take advantage of from a cloud platform or a service platform that you build your service out on. So, let's take the rose tint glasses off for a moment because my gut feeling is, and I've been doing this for three years now, you know, I'm hearing some similar conversations year after year about the progress of IoT. If ever there was a time when we might say to ourselves, you know what, we might be at that peak of infl uh, highly inflated expectations, or we might be just dropping into that trough of disillusionment, it might be about now because, geez, there's so much pressure on us to be successful with IoT. All of the analysts are telling us how many billion things we're going to deploy and how many millions of dollars we're all going to make out of building these IoT solutions. There's so much complexity in what do I build and how do I build it and what do I connect it to and, and what services should I use. If I was a startup thinking about building an IoT solution today, I wouldn't know where to start. The complexity is, is massive. So there's a lot of challenges out there. There's a lot of complexity. It's still a very much an industry in its infancy. And that's not to say that's a bad thing, but I just think sometimes we need to kind of take a step back, temper our enthusiasm a little bit, and think about really what are we actually trying to do when we think about building IoT services. The other problem I have is this. What the hell is IoT? Is this IoT? It's a connected device. I have too many of them in my house already. I communicate with it, I talk to it, it tells me interesting things, it plays a lot of music for me. It's pretty smart, it's connected, so it fits most of the criteria. But this is IoT too. This is a complex robot that does things beyond my comprehension and everything in between. You can stick a, a, an airplane in there, you can stick a, an MRI machine in there, you can put this in there and call it IoT. Everything and anything is IoT. So it kind of, it almost means nothing anymore. It's, it's become this phrase we throw around to describe a thing that we can't really put our hands around. And that's confusing and that's difficult for me. I think that's one of the biggest challenges we have is we should never have called it IoT in the first place. It's really not a nice name. It's hard to describe. My, my, my sort of yardstick is if I can't explain it to my 70-year-old mother, it's probably not a good idea. She has no idea what I do. <laughs> she hasn't done for the last 15 years. So, so anyway. That probably says more about my mother than me, actually. Um, so look, it's, we don't really know what it is. We don't really know how to describe it. We're, we've got those overinflated expectations about what we're going to deliver with it. So, shit, it sounds like it's pretty hard. So I want to spend some time talking to you about three, I guess, lessons I've learned or, or things that I want to bring to your attention that I consider to be things we kind of need to take a step back and go, okay, right, that's what we're really trying to do here. And I'm going to share some customer stories from around the region. So I'll give you some examples of scenarios where we've kind of broken out of this and, and, and delivered something. So here's the first thing. If you're building a product today, if you're a startup, you're thinking about getting into this space, nobody's buying IoT. I've never seen an RFP saying, we'd like to have some IoTs, please. I get called into meetings, or I used to, not so much now, I used to get called into a meeting and say, look, we need to define our IoT strategy. And I said, what the hell does that mean? You, you want to build things, you want to, you want to connect things, you want to solve, what, what are you trying to solve when you think about this? So, to me, IoT has become a bit of a pseudonym. It's become the pseudonym for connected things and smart outcomes. And somewhere in between all of that is this solutions we're going to build that delivers on this outcome of IoT. But nobody's building, buying IoT, but people are solving problems with IoT. And IoT is the means to an end. It's the outcome. It's not the thing you're going to do. And I think we need to really start thinking about this. All of the times I've been engaged with a customer or a partner or we've done some, something successful, that ultimately was IoT, but we didn't think about it at the time. It's because there was a business case, or a use case, sorry. There was a thing we were trying to do, and it was driven by the business, not driven by IT. But it needs, it needs IT to be involved. It needs the business to have buy-in. We need to be solving a problem. And there are very high-level problems here. You know, We're going to create some new service, opportunity in a new market. We're going to make a smart building, terrible name, could be anything. We're going to predict the maintenance. We're going to manage cost in some way. Think about the outcome before you think about what you're going to build. Inside of Amazon, we have a process uh, that we use uh, in the way in which we create new services and think about bringing new technologies to business, to, to market. We have this process called the working backwards framework. And so if you want to build something in Amazon, if you have an idea, I want to build widget Y, it's a great idea. The first thing you do is you write something called a PR FAQ. You write what would that look like in the press? 
If you were to build that thing, how would you tell everybody about it? How would you get them excited about it? What would be the vision? What would be the impact to people? What would be the impact to the customers? If you can't build that framework, then you probably don't have a product to build. So when we think about IoT, and there's sort of a mantra that sits around that, which is we start with the customer and we work backwards. And I think when we think about IoT, we need to be starting with a question and working backwards to the solution. We're not thinking about this thing I could build and then what does it do? We have to go the other way around, which is, seems really, really obvious, I know, but you'd be surprised how few IT people think that way. It's not how we've been built for the last many years. So, I want to share with you a customer story. Who knows how many different types of roti bread there are? Apparently there's like 50 plus different ways of doing it. This is a product that you make with flour, oil, and water. Yet the complexities of that product are very, uh, very rich. And the process of making roti is not a process that you can just do easily. Not anyone can do it. It's a very, it's a tactile process. It's about really understanding the dough, the proving, and the, and the, nerd, and the kneading process. So this company, Zimplistic, is the company's name, based out of Singapore, started by a, a hugely uh, exciting guy to meet. He's just very passionate about food and healthy eating and enabling people to get back to eating these kinds of products. They built this Rotomatic product. Now, what this Rotomatic product is, is it addresses the challenge of People have busier lives now, so they're not eating as healthily as they should do. They're not making decisions about what to eat the day before, like they used to do. They're making the decision 15 seconds before they want to eat, oh, we'll have this today. So this product is about taking something that is a very hard, complex, time-consuming thing to make, making the dough and everything right, and just making it an immediate solution. Now, I want to make an automatic bread maker. Now, it seems pretty straightforward. We've got bread makers today. They kind of work. I like them. They work well for me. The difference here is every single component of this device, every, and inside it, I've seen inside these machines, the sort of the, 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 the mechanics that do the kneading, it's censored, it's pressure censored, temperature censored, moisture censored, it's validating that the dough that you're building is exactly the right kind of dough for the right kind of roti that you've chosen to make. And of course, all the usual things, you can set it and forget it and it'll make your bread for you when you want it. But the design is, you decide five minutes before you want to eat, you want ro fresh roti, you can have the machine making fresh roti within five minutes and they're popping out the bottom. They have a, a wall in their development center in Singapore. They've got about 40 of these machines on a wall in various stages of development. And they're just throwing roadies at you left, right, and center. It's great. <laughs> Love it. Um, so look, and they built this around this IoT framework. And they've in embedded IoT to do a couple of things. First of all, obviously, to learn the device, to learn better about how people are making roadies, and to upgrade recipes, give them new, new recipes as they come on board. And obviously, beyond roti, flatbreads, pizzas, and then you can think industrial size ovens, automating that whole process. The other thing is remote troubleshooting and management. So when people use a machine to make food, they expect the food to pop out the other end perfectly. If it doesn't, they want, to have, they want immediate support on that. So they actually built a framework about remotely monitoring these. And if they see some issues with someone's roti machine, they'll actively notify them through their mobile app. Hey, you, know, you might need to get this changed, or your, your balances are wrong. You've got a little bit too much uh, um, flour versus water, whatever it may be. Love it. They've got about 15,000 of these devices already in market. Excuse me, they're still a startup, but they're 15,000 deployed across the US and they're looking to go global uh, very soon. Great company. IoT is not simple. In fact, it's probably one of the most complex IT ecosystem things you might end up having to build because it touches so many things. And we've heard, you know, we heard yesterday, I was in the agri session, you know, the, 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 the tyranny of distance and, and networking and you know, costs that we have here in Australia present huge challenges for IoT at, at scale in a country like Australia. But even just peeling back from a specific area like agriculture, IoT solutions are complex once you realize what you're actually going to be doing with that solution and where it's going to fit into the ecosystem of the customer or the environment you're going to deploy it. Sure, there are devices and sensors, and we have a number of really great technologies and, and providers here in this country and around the region that build great sensors, great technology. And those sensors need to connect to a network. And you have a plethora of options for networking today from you know, low range sort of Zigbee Bluetooth all the way up to long range and LoRaWAN and Sigfox and, and others. But there's all of that connected infrastructure. We then need to do something with the data. And if your data isn't connected to some platform that can be and use the data in an analytic, analytical way, in a practical economical way, then you've got a problem. But this is the biggest challenge, is it's none of that. It's actually the fact that whatever you build, 90% of the time, 
it's going to have to fit into an existing infrastructure. It's going to have to plug into that customer's existing asset management framework, into their existing process framework. If you're doing a customer engagement tool for IoT, it's going to have to fit into their CRM solution. It's always going to have to fit into something that's already there. And I think we tend to think a lot about IoT in this isolation model. Let's just build something new and people work around it. We are creatures of habit. We will stick to what we know and how we do it. And systems are similar. We need to kind of make IoT mold into what that customer is doing. It will, it's kind of like the boiling frog situation. Over time, the watermark will change and we'll start doing things differently. But to be successful today, you need to think about what are you going to be building your system and integrating it into. But there's a common thread through all of these things, which is that the power or the value of what infrastructure can provide to you. And I think you know, Delan sort of touched on this when he mentioned something, which is there is sort of an IoT platform. There's a commonality between all IoT solutions. And I'll explore this a little bit in the next slide because there's a challenge as a vendor of IoT and as startups and, and businesses that are going to take advantage of IoT. There's a challenge between the effort versus the return. And I think it's quite interesting, <coughs> excuse me, if you saw recently how GE uh, with their Predix platform, uh, fantastic technology, fantastic partner of ours, but they took some time out to kind of really think about what is Predix actually trying to solve? What outcomes do we really want to be building out of Predix? Because if we have an IoT platform, it's too vague, it's too broad. So here's the challenge we have. Sorry, I thought that box was up there when I was talking. We have a platform. If you're building an IoT service, there are some things you're going to want to do every single time, which is you want to have a a secure platform, a standard platform. You want security built into it. Standards enable consistency. Consistency enables simplicity. Simplicity and security enable trust. And these are the foundational pieces of anything you build in IoT. If, you're not, if you don't have those pieces in place, you're, you're going to struggle. But then as you get into the industry that you're going to apply your service to, if you're building a solution for retail, you're probably dealing with low-ish value or cost assets in a highly concentrated area with strong network capability. If you're working in utilities, you're working with a far, far spread out, more diverse set of infrastructure. Each asset is worth tens of thousands of dollars, and you have no connectivity to it. So your, your problem starts, or your solution to that problem, I should say, starts to narrow a bit into the vertical. And then when you get down to the next lane, you're actually building a problem, a, a solution to do power step monitoring in utility networks, stepping down from high voltage to low voltage, whatever it may be. Your solution becomes almost specific to the customer and their particular needs. And this is a real challenge with IoT today, is that it's, it actually is a little bit like a cottage industry. You've got to start building solutions that are vertical specific and sometimes even customer specific. So when you're building the solution, your 60% of your service, yes, is repeatable. But the remaining 40% gets less and less repeatable each time you do it because the outcome is specific. But of course, conversely, for the customer you're building it for, 60% of the value for them is in the thing you've built that actual piece that touches their network and their data and their infrastructure and provides their outcome. That's the difficult bit. So as, as vendors and as providers of IoT and people thinking about what they're going to build in IoT, look to the players in the market that can help you take away a lot of this top layer piece. Think about what your solution does in these particular areas and get specific, get, get detailed, get focused on the outcome for that industry. You'll build momentum from it and you'll build scale from it, but if you start building a platform for IoT without being specific, it's going to be a challenge. And a good example of that is this particular customer here. So this is, again, another Australian um, partner and customer we work with. So the partner is Dias. The customer is Environmental Monitoring Solutions, uh, a local company that manages fuel distribution and fuel uh, environmental leakage on, at, at fuel sites. So their challenge was, of course, they needed to automate what is today a fairly manual process. Somebody goes out, puts a dipstick in the tank, or looks at the water levels, or gets a reading off a device that's there. But there's a human intervention process. It's not real time. It's not as, as IT enabled as it should be. So DS worked with EMS to build a solution. But of course, to my point about complexity and integration, they had to build a piece of hardware. So they built a, a, a device connecting the services and pulling all the data. They had to fit it into what was there already. There was already tools there that built, you know, that are, there's a regulated industry. There's lots of data that's provided around what fuel tank statuses are and leakage levels and all these kinds of things. But in order to provide the connected solution and the real-time data, they've got to plug into that. And they're dealing with some unique environmental challenges. Garages generally don't have high-speed fiber network. Actually, many places in Australia don't generally have high-speed fiber networks today. Um, but you've got that challenge of network connectivity. And you've also got the challenge of constrained space. And you, know, you can't just go sticking new technology into the little broom cupboard at the back of the petrol station. 
So they looked at that problem, but they designed something that was very specific to this fuel monitoring service. But of course, as they strip away some of the layers, if they take it out of the, the, co the constrained environment, now they've got a service that monitors uh, fuel separa uh, uh, liquid separation levels in a tank. They can monitor water on top of oil, but now they can monitor, monitor any two things separated. They've got a solution that's a bit more transportable, but this particular implementation is very unique. And my last point, I'm going to go way over this time, by the way. Um, data is the goal. No doubt about that. We've been talking about it for a long time. IoT is all about the data you generate. But the things are really important as well. It's really key that we understand how important the thing and what data it generates are going to be to the success of your IoT solution. So in our world, two minutes. In our world, we think about IoT from these three pillars. We look at IoT from the thing, the cloud, and the intelligence. We sort of, we've taken that phrase and called it our thing, cloud orchestration, intelligence platform. That's how we think about IoT. And so, yes, we have the cloud piece in the middle, and that's really kind of fairly standard. We'd all think about IoT in that same way, a broker that captures data from things and allows us to squirt it into services that will turn that data into something valuable and useful, into an insight. There are a couple of interesting things we do inside of the cloud, a couple of things I want to draw your attention to, one of which is this concept of shadows. So in an IoT world, the things in the real world and the services that are going to connect to them are always loosely coupled. There's generally, they don't know about each other. I have a mobile app that talks to a fuel pump. Neither of them necessarily need to know about each other. The beauty of MQTT, MQTT is that pub-sub coupling model that enables you to have a device talk to something that doesn't know where it is. So we see that as a really important thing. But the other thing that's happening in the world is this concept of we're moving to the edge. And, you know, we talk a lot about this, and, and we all think of the intelligent edge as being an important area to be. This is a new area for Amazon. We took what was our cloud service IoT platform. We took it out of the cloud. And for the first time, we have a product or a service that sits outside of the cloud on your hardware, on your infrastructure, on your technology. It's this product called AWS Greengrass. It has that concept of the shadow. So I have an, an idea that a device in the real world, I can create a shadow replica of it in my virtual or my compute world that my devices can talk to. That loose coupling is enabled by the fact that I have a common frame of, of reference that's shadow. Applications talk to the shadow. They know it's always there. Devices talk to the shadow. They don't have to worry about what applications are talking to them. But the really key thing here, and we talk a lot about the intelligent edge and the ability to put ML and smarts and things on the edge here. The transformational thing is not the fact that we're moving to the edge. It's this split and separation from hardware dependency into software flexibility. Software on the edge lets us do more. It lets us enable that device, that thing, to live and breathe with the service that it provides. It's not just a piece of hardware that we're going to have to spend an awful lot of money to go and touch. I think Simon mentioned in his special session, Alex Group, you know, the, the biggest cost barrier to hardware is the minute you have to go and touch it. You've lost the value. So the last one I want to talk to you about is this customer of ours, again, here in Australia, a company called Centratech, who are an old company, a relatively old company, who provide monitoring systems to local councils. They have water sprinkler systems, the lighting systems, you know, when you book sports fields for your local sports team. These are the guys that have a service that turns on the lights for you at that, that, that time or maintains the, the ground. They were doing this with old hardware that was difficult to touch. It was hard IP addresses built into the firmware, that kind of stuff. Good book, Stephen. Is it? Oh, yes, Centratech's in the book. Yes, good point. We, we put the, the case studies in the book so you can read about it. So Centratech saw this problem with the hardware and said, OK, we need to, we need to rethink it. We, if we're going to scale out and become a bigger business, we need to get away from this dependency on hardware. So they took a look at some software-based PLCs. So software-based platform, Linux kernel, and then you drop on top of that the Greengrass service, which is running that device shadowing, the things network management, and they're using Lambda to replace the PLC functions. And now they have a smart living device on the edge that they can touch, they can update, they can manage. It provides them this expandable system now that they can kind of in the field update, over the air update, and manage and change. And it's completely changed the way in which they've thought about their scale growth now. They can start doing so much more because they have software at the edge that is under their control and not hardware they can't touch. I'm done. I can see you. I'm getting that look. I'm, I, I've, I've touched these three points. I'm not going to go over them. I think you kind of get my key points. I will leave with this one statement. If you knew the state of everything and you could reason on top of it, forget technology, forget costs, forget what you can't do because you don't know how to build it yet, if you could reason on top of that and you knew the state, what problem are you going to go and solve tomorrow? And with that, thank you.
Enjoy the rest of your day.